Welcome to the course Culturally Responsive Built Environments. Today we are going to talk about stone as a vernacular building material and what kind of techniques are used in the stone uh, laying and coursing and rendering. Uh, when we talk about uh, stone, in fact, especially in connection with the vernacular architecture studies, I would like to bring an important contribution, especially not only on stone, in terms of the materials, especially the vernacular resources and technology. And uh, this is where uh, the Brunskills work on illustrated handbook of vernacular architecture and his observation throughout England and United Kingdom, uh, how the countryside houses and how this, and how he classified the vernacular architecture in his, the way Amos Rappaport has classified vernacular architecture and how material as a subject to classify material and the size as a subject to classify vernacular architecture, especially if, if one uh, could take a, a region point of view or a country point of view or a national understanding. So initially he classifies the types of vernacular architecture into three categories. Number one, which is domestic, number two, agricultural and number three, industrial. So here, domestic purposes, the places, the buildings which are used for eating, sleeping, uh, doing all kinds of kitchen cooking, all kinds of domestic work. And it also extends not only as a dwellings, but it also can extend to the small homemade breweries or any kind of uh, uh, cheese making, of, uh, I mean, cheese making buildings. So there's basically a small cottage level buildings as well are included within the domestic. For example, if you talk about the ale houses of Nonington and how the breweries and how the women are especially employed in particular sections of, uh, uh, you know, this brewery and how they are, uh, it's a kind of uh, a family business or it kind of a kind of uh, a sect who are involved in this particular business, loc the local economies. So that is where we refer with the domestic architecture. And the second category refers to the agricultural. So for instance, uh, the farm streets, which are associated with the farm buildings, you know, it's not only about, uh, there's a difference between uh, uh, the farmhouse and uh, these uh, farm buildings, which are actually associated buildings such as barn, the stable, the granary, you know, uh, how, so if, even uh, if you are taking about uh, in the Dartmoors, you have these kind of long houses where you have a part of it as a stable and part of it is for animals and part of it is for the living cottage. So obviously there are uh, barns, there's granaries, which are used for storing grains in the harsh winter seasons. So uh, there are associated purposes. So that is where which are mostly relevant with the agricultural aspects. And the third aspect which he talks about, uh, for example, which, to, which are to do uh, with the production aspect of it, production of, uh, it could be a lime kiln, it could be a windmills, which can generate uh, power or which can pump water supplies. So basically if you go to Amsterdam or in the Netherlands, a, a lot of uh, windmills, even today they are kind of heritage orientation. So even certain lime kilns, certain cheddar making processes and all these things, you know, they are industrial production oriented. So that's how he classified into uh, the way the domestic purposes are uh, managed the way the agricultural purposes and associated uh, activities that are related to agriculture are managed and that, uh, that are linked with the production oriented, it could be industrial oriented, it could be windmills, it could be uh, kilns or anything like that. And uh, his understanding takes uh, not only in a broader terms, but it also, ta it also talks about the size types. So till now our discussion was about uh, uh, vernacular architecture is to do with a kind of tribal dwellings or a community level. But uh, Brunskill, when he refers with the material aspect of it, so he classifies into four categories. One is the great houses. 
In fact, uh, the great houses is often referred uh, uh, with the people of uh, the national, you know, uh, status. You know, who are uh, well known uh, in the nation. It could be a, uh, a royal family. It could be, uh, you know. Someone who is of a national repute, who used to live there, are chancellors, 16th, 17th century in the or in the medieval times. So how these people have lived and where they have spent their time. So that is where all these properties, which has a notion of an identity, you know, which carries an identity and to that place and even to that region. So that is where he talks about the great houses. For example, the Cadiston Hall in Derby in England and uh, so even that which is referred as a kind of uh, the place of uh, the, where the royals have stayed and uh, uh, so it is referred as a great house. And then slightly, I mean if you look at the way that he categorizes, it comes from the wealth and the status of it from a very broader, from the national level to the societal and the regional level and to the community level and uh, not only in the societal uh, hierarchies but also the by wealth and by the scale and by the building sizes. So the other thing he talks about the large houses the large houses which are referred with the kind of people of some local importance. He might be uh, uh, the, the governor or I mean the local manor house, houses which we see in each nearby each county areas. So some of these historic areas now, um, especially in Britain, uh, they have been uh, conserved and they have been protected and they also form a kind of landmarks as is because certain feudal lords might have stayed there and you know that is how uh, someone with a local importance has. And obviously it comes to the, again the peasants dwellings and uh, the normal cottages with the small house and the cottage. So, uh, but when you look at an vernacular understanding, uh, because for vernacular architecture, one needs a great observation. Because the material might be the same in all these categories. It could be stone taken from a great house to a small cottage or a small house. But the kind of detailing it went into, the kind of uh, understanding of the material and the kind of local understanding and the local resources and how they tap the local resources, that is one thing uh, one has to uh, give emphasis. And uh, that is where uh, you can understand the vernacular architecture, the domestication of how the local materials are produced and how they have been brought here and on how the skills have been. For example, on the right hand side, this is a small house when I was visiting Dartmoor. Uh, uh, so you can, if you could see that even the whole roof was with the slates. So it's not any tiles or anything, the stone slates because uh, uh, all these houses um, which were constructed with the slates. So the, if you look back how, why they have constructed it, because that is where in the nearby quarries and the moors, how they get these, uh, the slate as an abundance material. So. Uh, here is a small diagram, run skill points of what one has to notice. For instance, he talks about the first thing he prefers with the, on the facade, what is the walling material and what are its shape and what is its course and what is its jointing and what is its edge, the quions. So basically the quions, the jointing, the coursing will actually give uh, the whole, uh, talks about his whole skin. Then what kind of roofing shape? And the details of verge, is it a gable roof, is it a hip roof, is it a bansard roof? So what kind of detailing? And how the uh, details at the verge, you know, how uh, at the ends, you know, how the details have been brought. And not only that, the details at the eaves, how the soffit and uh, the eaves uh, actually been detailed out. What kind of materials? What kind of method of laying? Not only that, the ridge. So, what kind of ridge? If you consider in a framed construction, obviously an attic truss, obviously the whole thing, the wall and the roof, everything comes in one package. So, in that case, how the ridge is made and how the difference in the ridges. The chimney position, 
Now, if you take uh, in the context of England, now there are many historical uh, uh, houses which have the chimneys, but in today's generation, how many of them are useful? And still, why in certain, ca how, why they still have the chimney in order to maintain the character of that historicity? That is one thing that goes back from not only the vernacular architecture, it goes back to the urban design and the understanding of the whole uh, locality and its context. And what kind of water tabling? And Dormers. So what you see here is a kind of dormers, dormer window. In uh, the, the construction of a dormer window varies by, uh, in terms of its roof type, imagine uh, what kind of angle, what kind of height it is getting at a sill level, so where the dormer is coming and how the dormer is functioning, what is the width of the dormer, position, shape, roofing walling material and the plan form. Like in a long house, you have the part is a living and this part is for animals and it is all tilted so that the water is gets drained out. So similarly, what plan forms? Like in Japanese, Minka building, Minka dwellings, we discussed about how they lived with uh, uh, animals as well as how they uh, categorized the workspace as well as the sleeping spaces. Sectional form, staircase provision, window shape, window frames, right? In uh, recently, in, at the end of this presentation, I'll be talking about how in the Chanderi, uh, even the window frames and door frames, everything is made of stone. Door details, relationship between farm buildings and farmhouses, and the use of farm buildings. What, what is the purpose they are using it? So I think this is a very basic understanding of uh, how one has to study a building. <laughs> and. What we'll be talking about is uh, today about a brief techniques. You know, this is obviously any student of architecture, he might be learning about these techniques in his first year and uh, in the introduction to building materials and construction subjects. But still, it's a, I'm just trying to relate with the kind of study of vernacular architecture. So the moment it is not just only in a broader thinking of it, the more if you are going into the uh, study of buildings and uh, how they could be retrofitted or how they could be conserved in some cases, you need to know the details of the construction. You need to know the understanding, how the bonding, how the coursing, how the jointing, how the rendering, how the quions have been placed. So for instance, uh, if you look at this photograph, you can see that uh, even the window material is all with the stone. And a few, uh, I'll just brief you out how, how uh, different arrangements of stone and how, what are the technicalities inside. So the first one we refer as a kind of regular arrangement of stones, that is where we call the Kentish rag. And the second one, you see the elongated irregular types because they are all coming from the kind of sandstone and they come in a kind of regular formats and how they're a little elongated in shape and this is the one format. Uh, I was in Lake District in uh, England and uh, Lake District is famous for its uh, slate and as well as uh, the kind of stone buildings it has. So in fact, uh, if you refer to many of the literature on the stone buildings, Lake District, you can't escape the Lake District examples. So how the quarry faced uh, millstone, how this is a kind of how uh, certain constructions have been very famous because the slate is abundantly available there. And similarly in the Yorkshire, uh, you see this is also referred as a kind of Yorkshire penance uh, uh, style because the style is also denoted by its region where it is particularly uh, used and particularly represented because that is giving a unique character for that particular town or a village or a settlement or even a region. So when it comes to the coursing, like uh, you see that uh, it's an irregular rubble, irregular rubble, but uh, it is entirely uncoursed. You know, there's no proper, I mean, a proper order. But they're all. Uh, it's a kind of. Uh, there's in between. You have the kind of flat slab, which is giving a kind of bonding, sort of thing. Whereas uh, in this picture, what you see is, it is a regular joint interrupted at intervals. So you can see here it's a regular joint, but in between it is interrupted. So you keep a big stone and then that breaks. So that kind of gives a kind of bonding. Whereas uh, in this model, we see the brought to a level joint at regular vertical levels. So for instance, you can see here 
this part you are getting so it's a kind of working as a sill band or a plinth band or you know uh, it is breaking up till the sill level you are getting two sets of bands and with every horizontal joint continuous so basically these again a model of continuous so it's slightly if you uh, skim it so this is the model you are getting out and in the kions especially the corner stones uh, are usually bigger in nature and they are better finished than the rest so here if you see the rubble and uh, then you can see at the end you have the bigger stones which are giving a great finish and here if you if you look in the second model of uh, where the corners have been emphasized with the huge stones so there's an emphasis which has been laid out especially you might see in the the great houses as well where uh, the royals has lived so there's a clear emphasis of this particular uh, edges uh, have been shown because uh, that gives the whole elegant picture of the wall and uh, the it can also symbolize certain status as well and in terms of jointing if you see uh, this model you have the irregular stones have wide joints which have originally or later been so pointed with lime mortar or to spread over the surface so basically the irregular stones have a wide joint because they are not in a uniform nature so but later on it can be pointed with a kind of lime mortar so basically you have the lime mortar finish or it can just be spread over so that i think in the rural villages of india also you find this thing very common this is another technique called galleting little stones were pushed into joints as galleting so basically what they do is this you will find in chanderi as well in the indian uh, context which we uh, will come across uh, so what they do is they push uh, small small rubbles inside these bonding so that creates uh, a bonding and here in this model you can see where a bedding material was unprotected by pointing it would be leached away by rainwater to give effect of a dry joint so you can see that you know so it should get a kind of effect of a dry joint there's a dry stone masonry where we don't use any mortar or anything which is again relevant prevalent in chanderi in the parts of chanderi uh, so here what they do is they do a kind of pointing work unprotected by pointing it would be leached away by rain water so but there are some issues like how the rain water can percolate and stay whereas in rendering you know um, the lime sand the renders were used and this was troweled to a rough surface and was dashed with pebbles or was dashed with pebbles was whitewashed so here the lime sand rendering has been applied and as well as sometimes uh, a rough surface will be created so basically some kind of renders will also be applied now coming to the ashlar masonry which is not very common from the vernacular uh, architecture because till now what we talked about the kind of very rough Uh, textured but this is much more finished quality what you get but still if you look at uh, you need to understand the kind of uh, techniques like you see here here the each course was uniform height and the stones would vary in length so you can see they vary in length and in this case if you say the both length of stone and height of stain could vary without substantially affecting the richness of appearance so that is uh, the second case and but here if you look at it sometimes the courses were of an even height but more often they varied height in such a way as to, so the by the time you go to the top it diminishes towards the top of the the height diminishes to the top of the wall so that you know you have uh, uh, on the top you have a little projection out and that is how it is laid and the other way of it is also the ashlar dressings to rubble wall gave a key of the coursing that the way i talked about in the corners you have the ashlar the front and then how the rubble is filled within it in different courses and uh, similarly if you look at it uh, uh, here you have the similar techniques of uh, uh, how the edges have been taught and here if you look at it the kions were stressed where there is a demand of an architectural fashion so obviously they are dressed and they are stressed you know so that it can create a particular fashion, uh, fashion. and uh, the main important part is the ashlar work is the fine jointing and you can see because the most of it is a kind of uniform layered and here though it is an ashlar work but still they are all crudely uh, jointed rubble you know uh, work has been backed up into it so whereas again the stucco 
uh, which has a smooth face plaster. And uh, so these are various techniques in the ashlar constructions. Then uh, coming to uh, uh, cobbles and pebbles. So uh, cobbles where we actually get the kind of round stones uh, near the river beds. So that is where we use the cobbles and the pebbles which are actually, or again a very smaller ones of the pebbles which we collect from the shore as well. So uh, this is how the cobbles and uh, pebbles. So you can see here, so these are all basically, the pebbles are usually less than three inches in diameter and cobbles between about three inches and nine inches in diameter. So you have um, uh, there are different techniques how they have like the you have various things called uh, uh, the materials are globular and they may be flattened and here you can see the egg shaped and uh, in terms of so there are various ways how these pebbles are organized so sometimes uh, in a particular region a particular because of there's a sedimental flows you know uh, the whole rock surface gets smoothened and they might collect they might segregate them into different batches and they might use it for different uh, purposes and cobbles are usually uh, are usually laid on coast and relying on clay bedding to maintain stability and pebbles being more uniform in size were usually laid in courses so when the cobbles, because they are of, of a, not in a uniform nature, so they are uh, normally um, laid in a uncoast, and whereas the pebbles, they are in courses. So the elongated pebbles you see here, the elongated pebbles, or the cobbles may be in diagonal or chevron pattern. So basically, you have uh, a, a diagonal pattern, one on this side, one on this side. So that creates a pattern as well. And so like that, there are a few examples. So you have uh, a mixture of both the kind of uh, ashlar work and the cobbles fitting in. And you have the stone beds coming in the flat surfaces and intermediate, they act like a bands in the wall, which supports the strength. At the same time, you also works with the renders as well. But the main important part of this cobbles and pebbles is basically how it needs, a, it, it is a very difficult work because there are each piece is unique of its kind each and to put it in the uh, wall and how you actually create a good bonding is a very difficult task and and coming to the uh, flint so uh, this is also a kind of walling material which actually you get in the kind of more or less like in a kind of pebbles sort of thing in the and here there's again a different techniques which they have mentioned especially the flint walling, the exposed ends are round and irregular on surface in napped flint work, they are square and so basically there are different ways how they can actually arrange these flint works. The one you can see here, so there's a different band. So basically this is a, the flint becomes a kind of uh, filling material in between these bands. And also on the tops, how you actually uh, create a kind of coping sort of things and um, so similar to the cobs and pebbles, you can uh, look at, you know, the, all the details were given here, like for example, um, joints are thin forming a fine net effect over the black wall surface. So basically, uh, you see the plan here and you see the elevation, right? So basically these flints, they are actually put it like this and intermediate, they, have a, they, they themselves uh, get a kind of bonding over there. Sometimes the limestone is also combined with the flint. So here, this is basically what you got an understanding is various techniques uh, using cobs and pebbles, cobbles and pebbles, using flint, using ashlar, using random rubble masonry, uh, the Kentish tags. So now, uh, looking at the process, you know, one person I would like to refer is Oviti Akumu from uh, you know Nigeria, Nairobi. Uh, who were who was in University of Nairobi was also a colleague of mine, who worked on the stone quarrying. So in fact, uh, he actually worked on the. He's a building economist, and uh, he was working on uh, uh, how to streamline the artisanal dimension stone. In fact, uh, he looked at the kind of processes. One is the removal of the overburdens in the quarry, then the drilling of the stone, and the cutting stone after blasting, and the final part, how you chisel them out, how this is where the hand tools, and this is where how you want it to uh, deliver it to the site. So that is where 
the whole process is about turning rock into a dimension stone. And uh, again, we discussed about uh, ashlar masonry, and this is also one of the form of uh, dry stone stacking. When with this photograph, what you see, there's no mortar used. Uh, usually, if, when I was working in School of Planning and Architecture, Bhopal, we used to take our students to uh, document various vernacular building typologies, sometimes completely based on mud, sometimes the whole villages are built with stone. So these are some few examples from the Chanderi district. Uh, where even the staircases, you can see uh, the cantilever staircases and the sills, how they use to develop windows, everything is made of stone. And not only because the whole quarries do exist there and then that is the most abundantly available material. So you also have to understand a few technical terms uh, like kind of bed surface, corbels, cramps. Cramps is a kind of connections between these stone works. It could be a metal plate, a kind of cramp which connects. Usually you find in the historic temples uh, sort of thing. Here you see the even the roofing material is uh, very thin slabs. Uh, if you look at uh, the girder, this, the stone girder here and then uh, these stone slabs have been and then they filled with a kind of lime mortar or something like that so that it doesn't leak out. But the, just without using any kind of mortar or anything, simply with the, the way the mass constrictions are happen, uh, because there are two types of uh, construction, if you understand broadly. The, the one is the mass uh, construction system and the other is the framed construction system. So here the load, you know, the transfers from and the frame it distributes with the skeleton over. And, uh, and in the frame you will see in the next class we'll talk about the timber and that is where we see we talk about the timber framed constructions and uh, here you can see even the entrances the door jams uh, how they are all made completely without using any mortar and uh, you can see uh, a repetitive courses here there's a tin stone there's so this is of one layer and then you have a thin layer, horizontal layer, and then this is another layer. So in like that, within that informality, there is a formal arrangement. And again, this is one thing of a render example. So people used to put a kind of slurry and the cow dung, and then they try to cover these walls or kind of give a render. And this is all again a render. This is all the stone constructions. Even the cow sheds, how everything is built with stone. And the intricate uh, work, if you look at the the way the detail is worked out and the look at the jam detail, it's a very thin slate here and here normally what they do is they keep uh, uh, lamps in the evening so that you know it's an auspicious thing and uh, a low sill windows. So this is all meant for its climatic reasons as well as the local resource and obviously this is very unique uh, kind of uh, thing. And you can see the finishes, how they are joining with this cow dung and the kind of slurry what they get and the finishes. It's almost like a kind of wattle and daub uh, construction, but here they're embedding with the stones. And uh, I would like to end this lecture of the stone, like a good example of uh, Raja Rani Mahal restoration done by Intact. One of my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Ramesh Bole, was involved in it. And uh, if you look at this whole reconstruction, everything, even the doors, this is all the metal frame. And uh, there's all the stone slabs, which are intricately worked out and restored back. And now they've started a kind of digital uh, center for uh, the sari uh, prints and as well as, uh, you know, so to empower the local economies. So this is a good example of uh, the stone, how it is very much useful if you understand the stone construction techniques and especially it is very important in the construction and conservation areas. Thank you very much.